Good morning to everybody, and uh, I'm sorry you're a bit late. Some people are still recovering from the night life of Buzius. Um, so this is the third of our mini courses on the 2018 research in options. And uh, before I start, I'd like to mention that um, we are very fortunate to have the support of a number of uh, organizations and bodies and uh, research projects. Uh, in particular, we are sponsored by the Brazilian government through the Ministry of Science and Technology, the Ministry of Education. We also had the support from INCTMAT, the which is run by Professor Palis, who is here. And um, we had the, also the support from B3, the Brazilian Stock Exchange. Uh, I believe Ana Beatriz is around. Well, she, she's not, but we have Daniel Zachary here representing B3. <coughs> and um, we also had the support of IMP, of course, and the support of LANCA, the lab for applications that uh, I run at IMPA. And uh, we are extremely happy to have Professor Jim Gatherell. Um, Jim is a standard and uh, well-known worldwide through his works in math finance, most specifically in volatility. And uh, so today we're extremely honored. It's a special day for everybody. So, so Jim, please. Thank, thank you, George, and for uh, that. Uh, yeah, you can tell I have the microphone yes. on. So. Uh, so thank you, George, for inviting me to uh, Buzios. I'm very happy to be here today. Oh, Let me, uh. and this mini course is very is going to be very much in the style of Sebastian's from yesterday, except that. Uh, so the idea is not that you understand everything that I present. The idea is that you get a taste of this material. But unlike Sebastian, I also give you the code. So you can go away and play with this code uh, after the lectures. A, I have an, an enormous number of slides, so I'm going to speak very fast. Please interrupt me. If uh, there's anything you don't follow, it's going to be more fun for everyone if you interrupt. A, the lecture, two lectures. First one will basically be uh, econometrics and forecasting, and the second lecture will be pricing. So let's get stuck in. Uh, I'll start off by giving you a very brief introduction to R and the IPython notebook for people who are not familiar. I imagine that most people are familiar with IPython notebook these days, but may not be so familiar with R. Uh, then we will uh, look at the scaling properties of historical volatility that are very stunning although many of you here will have seen these before. And then we will use these uh, scaling properties to motivate a very simple model of volatility. And uh, then uh, we'll show some application. And the specific application that we have in mind is the forecasting of uh, volatility. So what is R? R is basically a free version of S. And it was created by these guys. There's a link here which you can click and uh, completely free. That's for me from Scotland and probably for you from Brazil. Uh, this is like a major motivation to use R. Actually, I think it's more beautiful than S. And as for IPython Notebook, the great thing about IPython Notebook, I think it's kind of, I, I imagine it's kind of a copy of a Mathematica Notebook, but it's better in the sense that you can use LaTeX, uh, so you can have mathematics and code all in the same container. So you can, you can present your mathematical argument and then show it implemented and run it all in the same place. So what's the motivation for this whole story? And what was the motivation for examining the scaling of historical volatility? Well, originally, I visited Masaki Fukasawa in Osaka, and he was showing off his work. And then I saw one of his examples, which was uh, 
volatility modeled as a, a function of fractional Brownian motion. And he showed in great generality that this would generate a power loss skew. And I thought, oh, that's very interesting because I'd been trying to come up with something like this for many years. And uh, I tried it, and indeed, this seemed like a magical model. Although there were most things I still didn't understand, this seemed like a magical model. And then a long time later, I had a PhD student from Mathieu Rosenbaum, a guy called Thibaut Gesson, whose name will appear repeatedly in this. And uh, I said, well, what am I going to do with this guy? Well, we're going to look at some historical volatility data and see if the scaling of this historical data is consistent with this simple model. And indeed, as soon as we started looking, we saw that it was. So can we study the historical time series of instantaneous variance? Well, clearly not, because it's a latent variable. What we can study instead is we can study integrated variance, or more precisely, some statistical estimate of integrated variance is what people call realized variance. There are many, many estimators. A whole bunch of them are listed in this particular paper here. And the particular estimate that we will focus on is called realized kernel. And there are many realized kernels, but we just pick the one that's available in this database here. A wonderful database that emerged from a joint venture between a hedge fund, MAN, and uh, Oxford. Um, they maintain this database nicely pretty much every day. Um, and again, it's freely available to everyone. So, a computing realized, computing these statistical estimates of uh, integrated variance is in principle very straightforward. I mean, you can go and look at uh, that paper again, and you will see how straightforward it is to implement these things. So, that's not the difficulty. The difficulty, as always, is cleaning the data. So, they performed a huge service to us by uh, giving us these very clean estimates of historical realized variance. So, each day, for about 31 different indices, all trades and quotes are used to estimate realized or integrated variance over the trading day from open to close. So let me repeat. We're not uh, looking at the time series of instantaneous variance. That's impossible. We're looking at the time series of integrated variance from the open to close each day. And then we just look at the scaling properties of this data. Well, now. This is the first challenge. Let's see if we can get this to run, since this code is, in principle, running live. And, uh, but internet has been great in this room, so let's hope for the best. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's Sunday morning. Maybe we should pray. <laughs> is it going to work? Whoa. Well, I was connected earlier. Okay. okay. That's the first question. Come on. Is it really so slow? Don't worry. It's a Sunday morning. People are still praying for slaves. Yeah. Now the prayers are getting more desperate. to the wrong place. Where I want to do to is to see if this internet is still working. Is the internet still working? Yeah, yeah, it's still working fine. So hopefully. No, but this is still going. Maybe, the, maybe, it's, uh, maybe the you're uh, throttling me, stopping me from downloading data. Could it be? Ah, it worked, it worked. Thank you, Marcos. <laughs> right, so then I'm going to load these um, R libraries. This is another huge benefit of R. Of course, students are going to say, why don't I use Python? So a senior guy told me this is a generational thing. I prefer R, you guys prefer Python. R is generally more um, concise than Python. and. Uh, Huge benefit is there are all these libraries. So QuantMod is a library created by some trader in Chicago for time series. REPR, this just allows me uh, to make the pictures prettier. So now 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this data that I've just downloaded and put it into our format so that we can, uh, yeah, okay, that good. That ran a bit faster. And then we're going to be able to see this thing live in principle. Oh, no. This never happens to me. How can this be wrong? Okay, let's hope it still ran. No. Okay. So we are going to have to do something drastic. What are we going to do here? Uh, error in XTS. Oh, because some of the data didn't download, sounds like. Okay, so in this case... You have your data locally. Yeah, I should have data locally unless it's been overwritten. Let's see if we can go further here. Let's see. Let's see if it still works. No. Okay. We have a small problem now. What are we going to do? I mean, the first thing is to blame somebody else. <laughs> uh, Honestly, Lord. this so never so happened to me. Huh? Yeah, that's a great idea. This never happened to me. It was too ambitious. But, no, you know, honestly, this never happens. So, uh, where are we going to look uh, for... Um, okay, we have... Research. Uh, okay, where, 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 where? IPython courses and workshops. So let's see if I can get some old copy. And uh, no. Okay, let's just copy from here. And let's hope for the best. This will be old data, but it's good enough. And then here, and then Brusius. And then you see this downloaded. It looks OK, but there's something wrong with it. OK, let's just hope that this works. Well, you know. No, 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 no. Okay. We are going to try and run all the code as if. So this one we're going to ignore. And then this one ran fine. This one. Okay. Hopefully that ran okay. And this is the cell that didn't run. Ah, same problem. Ah, what am I going to do? But, uh, but now you we need to. Your data, right? Yeah, we need to. Uh, we need to breathe deeply now. Order by cannot contain NA, so we're somehow. Uh, Okay, may maybe it's looking in the wrong place. Okay, so s set. Add. Okay, let's try this. Uh, try this. No such file. Okay. What should I do, George? We need to find some other lecture that I can use. Um, I suggest I, I, I may have a solution if you give me two tabs of your own CPU. <laughs> this is really embarrassing. I'm so sorry. Uh, Uh, well, the, 
I've actually given it the wrong directory, which doesn't help. Although I can cheat. Let me see. Uh, I can put this here. Okay, so now let's try that. Try again. Um, okay, if this works, then we thank all the saints. I just don't understand what's going on. I've never seen this error. Uh, all right, so now I need to find where I... What can I do? Uh, can I, maybe I can just go through the slides without running the commands. Maybe. Then I just have to uh, wave my hands and imagine. Right, so that's not going to work now. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Right, so can you show me where? Here? NA.RM equal to? Yeah. Or maybe just place the NA.RM in front of Okay. If you... No, no, there's no such function. Yeah, usually any.rm is uh, it's an argument so to a function. Yeah, d now I have it in the right directory. It's in the right directory. Yeah, yeah, okay. So now I'm trying to think if there's another lecture I can use. Let's just see if we can skip forward now. Because this is, OK, so you've got to imagine that there are these plots of realized variance, beautiful plots of realized variance. You're going to see they're very rough. We'll fix this later. OK, now, now we're running. I've got to be careful not to execute any code. Now we're back to, uh, so you can see this data is actually not so old. It's back to 20th of no November. A, Nothing live anymore, so uh, my friendly helper over there is going to fix the code for everyone here in Brazil. Uh, now, this simple model of realized volatility that was uh, shown to me by Fukasawa, and he took this model from Elisa Alos, because she had a, that as an example in her paper, um, it that simple model implies that we should see some simple uh, scaling of this form. If we look at the differences in the log volatility over, uh, over an interval of delta days, we should see that that thing scales as delta to the something. Well, when we do this, uh, there's the code. When we do this, we see some beautiful straight lines, right? So what do we have in this plot? We have the, it's a log-log plot, so we have the log of delta, in other words, the log of the interval in days, so we're looking at differences between the log integrated variance on one day and the log of the integrated variance delta days prior. So the log of this, the log of this gap interval is on the x-axis, and this log of the scaling quantity is on the y-axis, and they're straight lines, so what does this tell us? This tells us that mq delta is proportional to delta to the zeta for some zeta. And this kind of plot is totally standard in physics and econophysics in particular. And so typically, physicists will tell you, oh, this series exhibits multifractal scaling, by which he means that, uh, yes, this m is delta to the power zeta, but zeta is some complicated function of q. Well, now we can look to see 
what kind of complicated function of Q this is, and we see that, in fact, the result is incredibly simple. It's a linear function of Q. In fact, it's directly proportional to Q. And we're going to call this constant of proportionality uh, H. So we're going to disco we discover that zeta of Q is just Q times H. And this H is going to turn out to be the Hurst exponent, or the Hölder exponent, the roughness of the time series of volatility. Now, once again, we haven't looked at the historical time series of instantaneous variance here. We have looked at the time series of integrated variance, which is smoother. So that means our estimate of H is biased high. It's, a, it's smoother than the actual time series of instantaneous variance. On the other hand, it's noisy because these estimates aren't exact, and so our estimate of H is biased low. And later in the lecture, we'll see probably a more realistic estimate of H than this. So here we're seeing H uh, 0.15 just by computing the gradient here. The scaling property as delta goes to 0 is equivalent to H holder continuity of the paths of the volatility. And since H is much less than a half, uh, if you recall, a, a paths of Brownian motion have H equal to a half. Since H is much less than a half, we say that volatility is rough. And you will see pictures and other motivations for saying that volatility is rough. Now, we can repeat this analysis for all the 31 indices in the Oxford data set. OK, more code that we're not going to run. And here's what we get. You can see that H is similar for every index. right? So here we got 0.14. Let's get your favorite, which is Brazil. Um, which one should be Brazil? It should be uh, Bovespa, right? This one. Yes. See, 0.13. Similar vol of all, similar value of H. And uh, Mikko Pakkanen and his co-authors, uh, Mikko Benetson and Asger Lunde, they repeated this story for like 6,000 underlyings, and they found same numbers in every single case. So of course, we can't prove it's universal, but we've never found a counterexample. So it seems that volatility really is rough. And now I don't even find anyone who uh, disagrees with that statement. So having established these beautiful scaling results for the moments, how do the histograms look? Uh, what, do I mean, what do I mean by histograms? Oh, I can take down here. Yeah. Oops. So not only do we have beautiful scaling properties for the moments, but when we look at the log, which was the reason we were looking at differences in logs and not differences in vols, when we look at histograms of differences in the logs, they are very close to normal. Now, if we look more carefully, we probably discover they're not quite normal. But they're very close to normal. Now, I've superimposed two lines here, a red one and a, a blue one, if you look carefully. Actually, it's a beautiful projector. And in the case of the one-day lag, these two curves are the same. It's just a fit of the normal distribution to this histogram. By the time we get to 125 days, we see that the blue line is slightly different from the red line. So the blue line is a fit of the normal distribution to the histogram. The red line is simply uh, the one-day normal distribution dilated by a factor delta to the power h. So you see that, on the one hand, differences in the logs are almost perfectly normal in the data. And the second thing we notice is that this um, scaling property is true not just for the moments, but for the whole histogram. Just looking at the pictures, you can see that everything scales almost perfectly as delta to the power h. Is it universal? Well, I've, I've just said it seems to be close to, I mean, for a physicist, one example is enough. And, uh, these guys, because they're econometricians, they went to check on 6,000 different underlines. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question? Uh, the, the issue of fractality in yes. stock markets has been raised for the underlines right. many years ago by Mandelbrot and yes, others. Yes. So how, how does, uh, of course, you're talking about volatility, yes. but uh, 
Can you this comment is, thanks on for the, Yes, it's a great question, and this is going to be in a few slides. And if I forget to answer your question, please kick me verbally. No, I won't. Uh, so why might rough volatility be universal? Well, uh, Mathieu Rosenbaum and his student Thibaut Gesson, they showed that rough volatility can be obtained as a scaling limit of a simple model of price dynamics in terms of Fox processes. This model is the simplest model that you can imagine. Buys make the price go up and sells make the price go down. And the process is, the buy process is self-exciting. So as buys arrive, it's more likely that more buys are going to arrive. And as sells arrive, it's more likely that more sells are going to arrive, and so on and so forth. And when you take the limit, so long as the kernel of this Hawks process is power law, and so long as uh, the process is so-called nearly critical in that regime, you get a rough volatility model as the limit. In this case, rough Heston rather than rough Bergomi, which we're going to see in a minute, that the natural limit of this model here is so-called rough Bergomi. You're going to see why we call it that. So uh, suppose the following thing. Suppose that H is constant. It's not, but it's not too far from constant. Suppose those distributions that I showed you uh, were exactly Gaussian. Well, they're not exactly Gaussian, but they're very close to exactly Gaussian. And suppose that the scaling property that I showed you were exact. Then there's only one possible model that can be written down for the volatility, and it's this one. The difference in the log vol is proportional to the difference in fractional Brownian motion. And what is fractional Brownian motion? Well, it's a generalization of Brownian motion. If we put h equal to, to a half, we get classical Brownian motion back, as we can easily see here h equals a half, we get, imagine that t is greater than s, then we're going to get t plus s minus t minus s, so we get 2s here, and we get s. So it's obviously some kind of generalization of Brownian motion. If h is greater than a half, increments of fractional Brownian motion are positively correlated, so a trader would say trending, and in fact traders use this, they fit uh, they estimate the Hurst exponent of time series. I have no idea whether it works or not. I'm a kind of skeptical, but they do this. They estimate h of the underlying, and if it's greater than a half, they put on a trend following trade, and if it's less than a half, they put on a mean reversion trade. Well, here we're talking about the volatility process, and here we've estimated much h much less than a half. So what a trader would say is uh, the series of volatility is mean reverting. Now, it's actually not reverting to anything, but it's incredibly choppy. It's up and down, up and down, up and down. Now, we're going to need, uh, there are many, many possible representations of fractional Brownian motion in terms of Brownian motion, but the one that is going to be uniquely valuable to us is the one that starts at minus infinity. This is the thing that stuck me for a long time, is how to generate a term structure of volatility. And it turns out to be natural to think in terms of a, a process that started, as I like to call it, at the Big Bang, at the origin of time. Um, so basically, uh, fractional Brownian motion is represented as an integral of Brownian motion since the beginning of time with a power law kernel. So, so far, we just used simple regression to estimate h. We did log-log plots and drew straight lines. Uh, it turns out that there are much more efficient estimators of h. The most efficient one that we found is the one that was uh, introduced, I believe, by uh, Mikko Pakkanen in the same paper where they tested those thousands of underlines. Um, did I write down the estimator? No, not yet, but you will see the estimator in a minute. So let's do a little heuristic derivation. So this is the covariance structure of fractional Brownian motion. And up to a multiplicative factor, our model is simply that uh, the log of the variance is fractional Brownian motion. In that case, the variance of the log of variance should just be t to the 2h. And the covariance has this structure. Dividing one by the other gives us the correlation function, this thing. And so one minus the correlation function 
gives us that. So now if we do a log log plot, log of this is going to give us 2h times that. So we do a log log plot of this quantity and the gradient is going to give us h. So this is the estimator. Taking logs of each side, we get the log of 1 minus the autocorrelation function, which is easily estimated. One minus, log of 1 minus the uh, autocorrelation function is going, to, is going to give us a straight line versus log delta. And here's the code to do it. So now we can ask ourselves, is h constant? Well, h, uh, well, it's not clear, honestly, because the noise and estimation of h is very high. So this is an example of one year, 2005. Um, so honestly, looking at this, you could be forgiven, forgiven for arguing that, uh, well, maybe h is constant. It's just our estimation is noisy. But when you now copy, uh, let me see. So here's estimating h. It's a pity I can't run all this code. OK, so now I've estimated h using this estimator over some period of time. I get 0.1, which is a more reasonable value. And estimating it the other way just by drawing straight lines on a log-log plot gives me 0.15. So you can do an analysis, which we did in the appendix of the econometrics paper, the one that's entitled Volatility is Rough, because there are all these biases in the way that in, in the data. One is, you know, we're averaging, and so that bias is h high, and then there's noise in the data, so this bias is h low. You, are, you can account for both of the biases, and when you do this, you discover that this ACF estimator appears to be giving you a much more reasonable estimate of h. Now, here's a plot that I stole from Miko Pakana's paper. And here's why I believe that H is not constant. So, so, so as I say, you could look at these pictures and say, well, you know, estimates of H are just very noisy. It's unclear whether it's constant. But when you look at this plot, you can see that uh, the peaks of H of the volatility line up with periods of market stress. So he's marked the Lehman bankruptcy here, nice peak. The flash crash, another nice peak. The Greek de debt crisis, another nice peak. So my conjecture is, although it's hard to see how this works out, uh, something for maybe one of you to do, is there appears to be some connection between high values of H in the volatility time series and illiquidi illiquidity in the underlying market. So H tends to spike when the market is under stress. It seems to be close to zero when the market is calm. In other words, one might say in a perfect market, H should be half in the underlying, obviously, martingale, and H should be zero in the volatility. Why? I haven't made the argument, but this appears to be a decent conjecture. Perhaps H is related to underlying market liquidity, and then we see all these peaks. In particular, H of the volatility time series seems to be a meaningful and rele relevant statistic. In other words, it's not just some noise that comes from statistical analysis. And uh, now we can repeat this. Now, the big advantage that uh, Miko had relative to me is I'm dealing with this data, data, uh, daily data from Oxford. He had high frequency data. And so he's able to resolve H uh, much more finely than I'm able to do it. So I have these one-year uh, averages, which is why you're getting these sort of um, top hat type patterns. But again, you can see the H is varying from something like 0 0.05 to 0.25 or something. If I take one-year um, averages, and then we can do the same thing for stocks 50. We get a similar pattern. Is it the same pattern? Well, it is and it isn't. We can plot them together. We see that they line up uh, sometimes, and sometimes they don't. So they line up here and here. And so the conclusion for me is simply that, it, yes, it seems to be true that H is going up and down. And it seems to be a global phenomenon. Maybe it's related to liquidity in the underlying market. But anyway, H is a real thing. 
Is it the same as VIX? After all, if there's illiquidity or some kind of stress in the underlying market, we would expect VIX to be higher. VIX is the volatility index, for those who don't know. So then we download VIX data and superimpose. And what do we see here? Well, the blue line is VIX. And we can see here there's a peak in VIX. Doesn't seem to be corresponding to a peak in H. Here's a peak in VIX. And it is corresponding to a peak in H. So it appears that, a kind of boring story, sometimes uh, there is stress in the underlying market. And this is reflected in the fact that VIX is peaking. And the H also peaks. Sometimes H peaks. And there is no peak right here's H uh, spiking, but there's no, uh, there's no spike in the VIX. So somehow they're picking up different things. Not sure what. Sure. Well, you s right, right, right. So this is a question of philosophy. Uh, when I see, can you repeat the question? Uh, yes. Yeah, so what Martino said was, VIX is to do with forecasting the future, and H is to do with some property of the time series in the past. And then I, my answer was, well, this is an issue of philosophy. When people write forecasts in the literature, I don't believe that we're forecasting anything. What we're really doing is we're somehow filtering the historical data. And so in this respect, it's not surprising that if VIX is just a filter of the historical data, which I believe it is, and we're going to see some more evidence of that. And of course, it's related to forecasting in the sense that out of sample, it gives you good guess to what the future is going to hold. But the error in this guess, that's going to be, you're going to see the error in this guess at the end of this lecture is huge, right? It's just. Uh, this filtering process seems to give you more or less unbiased estimate of what it's going to be in the future. So forecasting is a language for me. When you construct a forecast, it's just kind of filtering historical data. So if we look at it this way, one way of filtering the historical data gives you H. And another way of filtering the historical data gives you the VIX. Of course, it's different in the sense that VIX is coming from people trading with each other. But these people trading with each other are just doing all sorts of fancy regressions, maybe even machine learning these days. And essentially, all they're doing is filtering historical data. Sure. That's right. And you see H increasing. So that's a great question. Thank you very much. So for example, during Brexit, we see H going up. There has been no event, but traders know that this event is occurring in the future. And I imagine you would see VIX going up for the same reason. This is, uh, I leave this for your, uh, that's hard work to do that. But yes, I w would imagine that you could pick something like this up. So we're not the first to write down a model uh, that says the log of volatility is proportional to fractional Brownian motion. In fact, Comte and Renault did this in the late 90s. And their model reads uh, the following. Black-Scholes, of course, ds over s is sigma dz, standard stochastic volatility in the sense that this is Black-Scholes. It would be Black-Scholes if sigma were constant. But now we impose some dynamics on sigma. And in this case, we just say that the log of sigma is proportional to um, fractional Brownian motion. Now, unlike us, they say that h is greater than a half. Why? Um, well, uh, OK, well, let's forget stationarity. We don't really care. Um, let's, why did they choose h greater than a half? Well, it's been widely accepted in the literature for a long time, for basically 30 years, that the volatility time series exhibits long memory. What do people mean by long memory? Well, they look at the autocorrelation function, and they say the autocorrelation function has a power law tail. Well, first of all, it's clear. When you draw the autocorrelation of volatility, we'll see it in a second. When we draw it, we see that it's very slowly decaying, right? 
So people say resilience or something. I don't know what they say. Um, but the question is, is it a power law? And does it integrate? A, a, is it integrable, this function, rho of delta, the autocorrelation function? If it's not integrable, in other words, if it's a power law, then uh, this integral doesn't exist. And we say that the, power ser that the volatility time series exhibits long memory. In order to get long memory from a model like this, we need h greater than half. And uh, as I say, this was uh, established many years ago. Heiko Ebens is a colleague of mine from uh, Merrill Lynch, in fact. So using some fancy estimator, they established uh, from plots like this one that a time series of volatility is long memory. Now, of course, they didn't have data that's as high quality as the data we now have. You know, I'm using Oxford, which has been using hundreds of thousands of ticks every day, and it's very clean. But essentially, what they said is, this plot here is a straight line. OK, now, it sounds like a joke when I say this, but you know, look at this. Tell me, is it a straight line? Well, obviously, it's not a straight line. But then if you're a physicist, you say, well, yeah, obviously, this is not straight. But this is straight, right? So they fit a straight line to that piece. Essentially, that's what their estimator does. And this is the result, right? So if you do this, essentially, you're fitting a model, which is something like fractionally integrated Gartz or something, standard econometric model. And uh, you get a number. And this number indicates that it should be greater than a half. Right, so in other words, just fitting a straight line to the log-log plot, we get something like this. And you can see that this is not integrable at infinity. And this, in fact, corresponds to a degree of fractional integration of 0.3. And it gives you h substantially greater than a half. However, you know, you've got to be careful doing statistics and econometrics because you're just estimating models, and the model might not be right. And in this case, it's almost certainly true that the model is not correct. Um, so now I have a little derivation that you can follow later. But this is a derivation of a formula that should, from our model, with h much less than a half, what would we expect the shape of the autocorrelation function to be? So this is the same data. And now we fit it. And this is what we get. So it's much more plausible that uh, our model looks like a much better fit to the data than this uh, Anderson, Bolas, Boleslav, Diebold, and Abens story. So now it's obvious from the model that you don't really want to uh, plot this covariance against the log of delta, you want to plot it against delta to the power 2h, right? This is clear in the model. And so when we do that, we get almost perfect straight line from the data. In fact, it still surprises me that we get such beautiful results from data. I've never seen pictures like this from real econometric data. So these scaling properties are absolutely stunning. So in the paper, we simulated uh, fractional Brownian motion and uh, in our model, and then just repeated the same estimation techniques that ADBE, under no, other way around, Anderson, Boleslav, Diebold, and Abens used, and we get the same results that they got. So essentially, it could be that the time series has long memory. We're not saying it doesn't. All we're saying is that the test that they used uh, to determine whether there's long memory in the data or not is misspecified. So their conclusion is not supported in the data. Uh, so here's a quote from that paper where Miko Pakinen looked at like 6,000 underlyings. Having examined intraday volatility measurements on the E-mini S&P 500 futures contract, we can conclude that volatility is rough. That's clear. Highly persistent. In other words, the autocorrelation function 
decays very slowly. And non-Gaussian, well, this is a point you're saying, we're naive to say it's Gaussian. OK, I agree with him. It's not Gaussian. It's pretty close, though. However, we were unable to distinguish between genuine long memory and persistence, yet technically short memory in the data. So he's saying, well, we can't exclude that maybe those, those guys are correct. Um, well, I mean, we're not arguing that uh, there's no long memory. We just say that you can't possibly tell whether there's long memory in the data. Essentially, there's not enough data to tell whether it's long memory or not. Now, a, so Comte and Renault wrote down this model in the late 90s where the log of the volatility is modeled as fractional Brownian motion uh, with h greater than a half. And I've given fairly strong arguments why this model can't be right. But when we look at pictures, we'll see that absolutely it can't possibly be right. And I remember when I first draw the, drew this picture, Mathieu was uh, complaining to me, this picture is stupid. Uh, this is just a regression. But this is our model. Our model is simply linear regression of log of this moment against log of delta. This is our model. Now, this blue line is the best that we can do with Comte and Renault. Why is it this shape? Well, the gradient for short times, for short lags, is related to h. And we know that h is greater than a half, so we just took it to be a half for this plot. Now, a model with h equals a half and no mean reversion is going to give, let's say, it, for the volatility surface, it's like Sabre, it's going to give us smiles that are independent of time to expiration. And obviously, that's incompatible with what we observe. So to make a model like this fit the vol surface, you have to uh, have mean reversion. Maybe that was not their motivation. I'm not sure what their motivation was. Maybe their motivation was stationarity. But either way, they introduced mean reversion. And because the model is stationary, ultimately, this line goes flat. So the gradient is a half here, and the gradient is 0 there. And you can see it's totally incompatible with the data. Now, uh, back to we're getting closer to your question, Georges. Does simulated uh, rough, I've got this wrong, RSFV should be RFSV, rough fractional stochastic volatility data look real? Well, the top time series is the actual time series of uh, log volatility or log integrated variance, to be more precise. And you can see the peak. You can guess where that what that peak corresponds to corresponds to, uh, of course, September of 2008 when Lehman collapsed. And you know you can mark the other peaks. And here is something that's been generated by the model. And the question is, do these pictures look the same? Well, I always have difficulty with the audience here. I can see that Martin is really staring at this and trying to find the difference between the two time series. I would say, honestly, if, if I was being very honest, I would say maybe there's a little bit of qualitative difference between the series. In terms of roughness, I can't tell the difference. So both of them are like h equals 0.15. But what I notice here is that we tend to have jumps up and then relaxation, whereas here it tends to be more symmetric between the past and the future. So this is a constant question that we get from Jean-Philippe Bouchot, for example. Is there time reversal asymmetry or not? We're still working on this. I think a lot of what is referred to as time reversal asymmetry in the literature is not really that. But it could be that there's an effect that still needs to be studied. Sure. Well, that, that, no, that's going to look very smooth. I mean, you can try, but it's going to look completely different. You think? Ah, I have to see. I, I don't believe it. I really don't believe it. I mean, and where does the? I mean, what kind of time? Re, uh, what kind of mean reversion are you using? Uh, the, 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we need to I need to I need to sit with you and see one of these pictures. And if, what if you measure the what if you measure the roughness of the time series that you generate like this? If you measure h for the time series, suppose you use my ACF estimator on the time series that you generate from your model, which is h greater than a half with a uh, mean reversion of two, what do you get? Yeah. You say that your, your, your model is the real data generating model. Yeah. Well, I think we know what we're going to get, right? Right, now, back to Georges' question. On closer, ex uh, so now, OK. So in respect of roughness, the simulated and actual graphs look very alike. Remember, we're comparing this with this. Persistent periods of high volatility alternate with low volatility periods. See here. H, roughly 0.1, generates very rough looking sample paths. Now, everyone here has done this before, virtually everyone. You've drawn time series of historical volatility, and you've seen that they look very noisy. I did the same for many years. And we didn't think about it for more than two seconds because we say, well, it's noisy. It's just, you know, these estimates are all over the place. But if you really look carefully at those estimates of integrated variance and you ask yourself, what is the statistical error in this estimate? It's not so high. So this roughness in the time series is real. It's a property of the time series. It's not because we um, because we have errors in the, because we have statistical errors in the observations. So rough volatility. Um, on closer ex inspection, we observe fractal type behavior. In other words, if we, here this plot is for daily data. We could redo the plot for monthly data, or we could redo the plot for hourly data we would find that the plots look very similar in each case. This is back to Georges' point about fractality. And in fact, Bakri and Musi, maybe in the early 2000s, they had a model which is essentially related to the rough volatility model in the limit that h goes to 0. This was a way of making everything exactly fractal. The reason why, uh, in our model, you see this appar apparent fractality is simply because h is so small. So if we take delta to the power h, right? So uh, imagine that delta is one day. One day, one day to the power zero is essentially one. And then we compare this with three months. OK, so that's like 60 trading days. 60 to the power zero is still one. So this dilation factor is essentially one over a large range of time scales. So what can we use this rough volatility model for? Well, if we could change measure from the physical measure P to the pricing measure Q, which we'll do in the next le lecture, then we'd be able to price options. Uh, so, yeah, as I say, we'll explore this in the next lecture. And another obvious ap op apl application is to volatility forecasting. So now, how do we forecast fractional Brownian motion? In fact, this is well known. Some engineers wrote it down. Uh, presumably because fractional Brownian motion was used in communications, um, computer networks and such things, telephone networks. Um, so they show, these guys, Nussmann and Poor, they show that fractional Brownian motion is conditionally Gaussian with this conditional expectation and conditional variance. In fact, that's easy to show. So what does this formula say? This formula says that fractional Brownian motion uh, delta days in the future is related to your measurements of fractional Brownian motion in the past. And there's uh, somehow something missing from this formula. But what, what does the kernel look like? Well, h is essentially 0, right? So this is basically square root of t minus s. And then you're weighting it according to uh, days past. So if you, 
analyze this formula a little more and you look at the shape of the kernel that you're using to um, integrate past realized variance, this is very similar to what traders actually do. If you were to ask a trader, uh, what's the correct implied volatility to sell a three-month option, his rule of thumb, and he doesn't have an option market, his rule of thumb is just to look at three months historical volatility. You ask him six months, he looks at six month historical volatility. You ask him one week, he looks at one week historical volatility. This is reflected in this kernel here. So where does this formula come from? It basically just comes from regression. The forecast formula comes from regressing fractional Brownian motion against its history. So if we uh, def now define the co these coefficients, we discover that a, though with this choice of coefficient, it, you find orthogonality. In other words, these betas are the normal regression coefficients. So it's just linear regression of future fractional Brownian motion against the past. So this is our forecast formula. We discretize this thing, right? So here is our um, historical log of instantaneous variance, and this is our forecast of future instantaneous variance. Now, notice one thing, though. Well, first thing is we're not really interested in forecasting the log. We're interested in forecasting v, which is the exponential of the log, and so we're going to have to so have some kind of convexity adjustment uh, which is reflected in this formula here, right? So we have it as exponential of the expectation of the log, which comes from the standard formula, plus this adjustment. The C tilde is just a constant. This nu is basically comes from the um, intercept in that regression that I did earlier. It's what I call volatility of volatility. So how do we discretize this formula? Well, for most of the points, uh, we just use the midpoint, and we have an extra adjustment for the first point. I don't know if I put that on the, um, yeah. So here, we approximate the first term in the sum more accurately by choosing a point carefully. So we choose this point S star in the interval for the first uh, point in the, in the discretized integral. So now we can implement all this in R. So pity I'm not demonstrating it live. But uh, so in order to forecast, we need estimates of H and vol of vol. We get these from regression. It doesn't really seem to matter much. If we go back to the forecast formula, we're going to see it's extremely robust, right? I mean, what difference does it make if H is equal to 0.1 or 0.2 in this formula? Basically nothing. You can see it's incredibly robust. And what about? A vol of vol, let's see, where do I want to go? Vol of vol, the only place the vol of vol comes in is here. Well, this probably has to be a bit better estimated, but honestly, uh, it's pretty well known from the regression. Um, it's fairly accurately known. So now let's do the usual thing that you might see in a Garch paper. So what do you think? Is this good or bad as a forecast? So here's our predicted vol on the x-axis, and here's the actual vol on the y-axis. You say, well, this is not very good. But remember, volatility is rough. So this is a fact of nature that volatility goes all over the place. So when you say forecast, it just means that you're doing better than doing nothing at all. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Well, let, let's. That's a great question. Uh, wh so, for example, one can ask. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. The peaks. Uh, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> The, basically saying, uh, asking a question about those outliers. Where do they come from, essentially, right? Because, you, because if you go back, can you go back to the, to the, to the comparison of the three layers there, the 
Ah, sure. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, this one probably, no. This one? Yeah. So this is like this kind of when those things happen, the thing can go further away. Yes, that's right. In other words, there yes, there tends to be a jump up and relaxation afterwards. That's absolutely right. Right. That's that's a very good point. And yeah, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. It seems that the physicists are right to say that there's some kind of time reversal asymmetry. The issue is they don't seem to have been able to quantify any measure which really can't captures this. Uh, but you're right. This is how the data seems to look. And in fact, we can ask where those outliers come from. Um, since we have the code, although we're determined not to run it, because uh, Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I don't think we're going to need it. I think it should be OK. Um, obviously, demonstrating life was, uh, but it's, al it's always worked for me in the past. For some reason, uh, I have bad luck today. I think it's, it's George's fault, for sure. Uh, so which point is the outlier? Look at the outlier point, 10th of October 2008. So it's no big surprise. And uh, again, that's the prediction for that day. So we can see that the actual realized variance on that date is like double the prediction. So something happened, and it was not predicted. So now we can superimpose actual and predicted vol. Again, this is the kind of typical plot that you would see in any Garch style paper. Look, my forecast is amazing. This is a day ahead. Uh, but I'm not sure what this kind of plot is meant to tell you. But yeah, what it basically tells you is that the real world is compatible with stochastic volatility. If the volatility is high today, it should be high tomorrow. Because my forecast is basically telling me what happened in history rather than what's going to happen in the future. It's some kind of filter. Now, we actually implemented this. In, uh, there is a site called VOLEX, which stands for Volatility Exchange. There's no exchange, as far as I can tell. They're trying to sell their indexes to uh, exchanges as a basis for traded products. As far as I know, uh, no product has been traded so far. But it's a nice website, and you can take a look yourself. There are two uh, forecasts. Uh, there's a choice of two forecasts on this website. Uh, one of them is due to Fulvio Corsi, so-called HARC forecast. HAR, people are maybe familiar with. This is his heterogeneous autoregressive uh, model. Well, let's not call it model. It's a regression. It's a very clever idea. Basically, he can um, replicate many stylized facts of the time series by regressing uh, future realized variance against a one day, one week, and one month realized variance in the historical data. Why one day, one week, one month? Well, because these are natural time scales for human traders. And if you think about his regression in terms of the forecast that we constructed earlier, you can imagine what this kernel looks like now. So this is the kernel that we're using to uh, filter the historical data to produce a forecast. So this is some kind of curve. It's some kind of power law function of distance in the past. We include points that are very old, but the most recent points have the largest weight. Essentially, what Fulvio is doing is to approximate this by a stepwise constant function, a piecewise constant function. So we can understand, in the context of our model, why his forecast is so good. Now, Miko and his co-authors, they tested Fulvio's forecast versus our forecast 
and in general, they find our forecast is better. But when we look at vol, when we look at vol X, we discover that his forecast is better, and this is because he didn't implement HAR, HAR, he implemented HARC, which is heterogeneous autoregressive with Kalman filter. I'm not sure what he did. He didn't explain to anyone what this Kalman filtering was, but whatever it was that he did, it worked. Because I, I think in this data, you can see that uh, he is better than us. Okay, so here's a screenshot from that website. So this is comparing the rough volatility forecast one month ahead with actual. And so we see here they're very consistent when everything is quiet. And then when volatility increases, well, obviously, we didn't forecast it because that's in the nature of the beast, right? Again, back to my philosophy of forecasting, you can't forecast an event. It's impossible. All you're doing is filtering the data you already have, right? So the data you already have says everything was quiet in the past. So we forecast it's going to be quiet in the future. And actually, it's not quiet. Something happened in real life. And so, uh, you know, basically one month later, because it's one month forward forecast, you start to incorporate this new information into your forecast. And now we're back. And then a new peak from this recent, uh, from this recent turmoil, China and so on. And you can see that the errors in the forecast are like positive and negative. But Obviously, it's hard to forecast. The errors are huge. You saw that from the scatter plot. Here's a comparison of uh, forecast errors from our simple estimate and Fulvio's. And if I recall correctly, Fulvio's is on the bottom and ours is on the top. And just looking at those histograms, you can tell that his is better. So I have an idea for making ours better, but anyway, that's more work to do in the future. Now, the HAR and rough volatility forecasts are both impressive, obviously based on this. Well, this is not HAR, this is HARC. I recommend if it's a choice between HAR and rough vol, you just implement the forecast that I wrote down because it's so simple. The only free parameter is essentially H, or vol of all if you want to be difficult. Um, uh, but so what's the difference if it's just forecast? Okay, HAR is just a simple regression, one day, one week, one month. Which would you rather implement, the simple regression or this forecast formula? So what's the difference? Well, the difference is uh, HAR, heterogeneous autoregressive, is just a regression. There's no model. Basically, that paper, which is a beautiful paper, it says, if you do this, you generate all the stylized features of the time series, whereas ours is a proper model. So what difference does that make? The difference is that we can actually place an error on our forecast. We can say, what should we expect the error in our forecast to be? He cannot. And of course, we can do the same thing with Garch. If you do the same thing with Garch, it will say, well, this is your forecast. And by the way, the error should be tiny, right? The error is huge, as you can see. So how good is the forecast? By how much is the variance of the future variance reduced by taking into account the whole history of the fractional Brownian motion? Well, of course, in practice, for a number of reasons, you, you don't expect this to work perfectly well. First of all, H is moving around. It's not true that it's constant. And so just by playing around with the data, I. I decided that 200 points was the optimal number of points in history, daily history, to take into account to optimize the forecast. So now we can compare uh, unconditional and conditional variance, right? So what's the unconditional variance of differences in the log vol? It's the thing we computed before. So this is the equivalent of forecasting using a monkey throwing darts, um, the error in his forecast is going to be given by the unconditional variance, which is this quantity m2 delta. And that is, those are the blue points, those unconditional variance as a function of delta, right? So the, that function basically is something like t delta to the power 2h. So that red line 
is what that is, right? So that's from the model. But what is absolutely stunning to me, and maybe Martino's going to disagree, and maybe he's going to explain to me why it's so good. What's stunning to me is that the conditional variance uh, spat out by the model is so close to the data, right? So, what, so how do we get these green points? We get those green points by taking the difference between the actual realized variance in the future and the one that's been predicted by the model. So we take these differences and compute their variance, and this, these green points give us that number as a function of days in the future. On the other hand, the orange line is what is predicted by the model. So for me, uh, this is incredible uh, vindication of this simple model. Incredibly simple model. The model simply says that the log of the volatility is proportional to fractional Brownian motion. Okay. So it, I'm really early, actually, Georges, after all this, because we haven't been implementing any code. We haven't been running any code whatsoever. So we can take many questions. So we uncovered a remarkable monofractal, not multifractal, but monofractal scaling relationship in historical volatility. This basically just says that a, um, these moments are proportional to delta to the power Q times H. Uh, so the Qth moment is proportional to uh, delta to the power Q times H. Conventional long memory models are inconsistent with this uh, scaling relationship, although Martino claims otherwise. He claims that he can generate time series with fast mean reversion, right? I, I have a question. Sure. Maybe there is a. Yeah. So that that was basically my point earlier on. Thank you. So, yeah. Yeah. So let me repeat Martino's comment slash question. Um, is it reasonable to say that H varies over time, or could it be that the estimator is biased in some way? And I think it's natural to wonder, as I mentioned earlier, when we show the plot of H varying over time, is it really varying over time? We don't know. But the key for me is that the peaks of H, of this estimated H, line up with e economic events that we can identify. That's the reason why I think it's real. Does it? It also is to bring in Matthew's point about uh, the automatic uh, on microstructure. Yes. Yeah, so just to repeat what Marcos is saying, and I strongly agree with his comment, um, if we think that the origin of uh, rough volatility is essentially microstructural, obviously the microstructure of the market varies with time. When the market is under stress, we're going to see a very different microstructure than when the market is you know, happy, happy in its normal condition. Um, the Hurst exponent seems to vary over time. And again, my argument for that is simply that we see the peaks lining up with these, eco with these economic events. This leads to a natural non-Markovian stochastic volatility mon model under P, the physical measure. What do we mean by non-Markovian? We simply mean that in order to compute anything, we need to take into account the entire history of the process from the beginning of time one application is to forecasting. Uh, the resulting forecast is both simpler than and superior to other available volatility forecasts. So it's certainly uh, far superior to something like GARCH. Um, there's no comparison between the forecast from GARCH and the forecast from this thing. Is it superior to Fulvio Corsi's? Well, it's certainly not superior to his enhanced version. But since he hasn't explained to us what he did there, I'll say it's superior to his published version. And uh, with that, I think we'll have, I'm very happy to take more questions at this point. Uh, I went through this a bit faster than expected. George, do you want to slow things down? Yeah, well, the, I don't know if, can you 
I think we'll just, uh, my vote is for the break, okay. and then, you know, we can take longer with lecture two, maybe. Yes. So, there are no further questions at this moment. Uh, let's thank... Yeah, Martino. Oh, oh Martino, yes, please, please, please. Just to be quite exaggerated, but... <laughs> no, I, I wonder about uh, um, what you said uh, on the, estimator, um, the estimation of AIDS, once again, and in comparison with the paper of uh, uh, Comte Renault. So you say basically that their method uh, is biased due to the quality of their data. So you're working with a much... No, 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 I, I don't think so. I said that a, one can imagine that, okay, let's go back to the pictures. This is a good question. Let's go back to the pictures. There are two people who estimated H. Well, one person who estimated H, namely uh, Anderson, Boleslav, Diebold, and Abens, right? Comte and Renault didn't estimate anything, I think, right? They just took previous results and... Uh, they borrowed their methodology, you can say. Right. Well, you can say that. I don't think they did any... Ex I haven't found a paper of theirs where they estimated anything. They just wrote down the model and uh, computed some con consequences of the mm. model. Right, so now. So this essentially is the data that ADBE were looking at. However, in those days, in the old days, 25, 30 years ago, they didn't have these beautiful estimates of daily integrated variance. First of all, the market wasn't as liquid in those days, number one. Sorry? Right. So, and secondly, they didn't even, they didn't even plot the autocorrelation function of integrated variance because this concept didn't exist at that time. That literature blossomed in the mid-2000s, let's say 2005 or so. Up to that point, if you remember, their rule of thumb was um, you need to draw, what was the name of their plot? Like, and they called it envelope, signature plot, right? Mm -hmm. So their rule is to draw a signature plot of a volatility uh, which depends on the uh, interval between the points in your data set, right? So they, the, the rule that they wrote down in their paper was never sample the underlying more often than every five minutes, because if you do it more often than five minutes, that's rule of thumb, you get highly biased results. So basically, in practice, they were throwing out most of their data in order to get estimates of integrated variance. And their plots, typically, were things like squared returns or absolute returns, which are incredibly noisy estimates of integrated variance. So one can imagine their plot. Their plot is basically the same plot, except it's an incredibly noisy version of this thing. And so, of course, we were kind of laughing when we say, let's draw a straight line here. But with their very noisy data, it wasn't so stupid, right? Looking at this plot to draw a straight line, because basically the plot was a mess. Now, coming back to Comte and Renault, I don't think they estimated anything. There is a paper by Federe Wiens, or I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, and uh, Alexandra Kronopoulou, I think I pronounced that right. Uh, there's a paper where they estimated H in the context of this Comte and Renault FSV model, and they decided that H was a half, uh, except during September 2008, where they estimated H of 0.53. So essentially, H, H a half. In the context of this model, they estimated H equals a half. Uh, yeah. Spike down. Uh, this one. Yes. Which year? Uh, here somewhere? Uh, oh. Oh, here. Yeah, I mean, it's a simulation. I mean, this is log, remember? Yeah. Okay, so, you know. People got very happy here, happy trading, <laughs> everything very calm. 
I mean, vol has been very low for extended periods of time. You can, you can see here, this is last year, remember? Uh, well, it should certainly be, uh, there should be some relationship with interest rates. Volatility tends to be low in the growth period of the economic cycle, right? Or when you're recovering from recession, depending on how you look at it, when you're recovering from recession, interest rates should be low. And, uh, you know, similarly, when you're coming, you know, out uh, towards the end of the economic cycle, the central bank tends to raise interest rates. And... Uh, yeah, this is probably something to do with increase in interest rates. Absolutely. That's a great point. Okay, so this is where really the tail is wagging the dog, to use the English expression, right? So what is the reason for these incredibly low uh, values of realized volatility. Well, I agree with you that probably the reason is that people were selling huge yeah. amounts of Vega and Gamma, just selling huge numbers of options to uh, this, what's your name? So to Lucas' point, um, investors have target rates of return of something like 8%. Interest rates are zero. Interest rates are zero. I go here. That's me. I, I, oh, it's I, you. I'd say, really, yeah, what's your yeah. fault this time? <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, target rates of return are 8%. So how do you generate 8% when uh, you know, interest rates are zero? Well, you just take risk. And so essentially, you sell options. And if all the professionals are long options, guess what happens? The underlying basically gets stuck. Right? Every time the market goes up, they sell. Every time the market goes down, they buy. And this is essentially the explanation for this until something happens, right? And then everything goes haywire, right? So that's, that's the story of life. And uh, the, in fact, probably what changed was February of this year, right? When uh, those VIX products went crazy. Uh, you know, retail investors were all short VIX as a trade that just makes money continuously every day, all the time. And uh, then overnight, boom, everything went to zero. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the point was it was just one night in February where everybody got margin called and their positions went to zero, essentially. Yeah, yeah that's right, that's right. That's right. So Lucas' point is that there wasn't a sudden jump in the vol. It was climbing slowly. The event that probably precipitated all of this, I would say, actually happened in February. Uh, but yes, you, your comment reflects uh, the difficulty of showing that there's any time reversal asymmetry in the data, right? Because I say, well, it looks as if it jumped up but actually, it, in some sense, it was highly predictable. You couldn't have predicted in the model this overnight event when everybody, basically, their positions go to zero, but uh, you knew something was happening. You can say something about age, I would say. You can say something about? About age. Yeah, 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 sure, age. yeah. Sure. Thank you. So, would you have some favorite macroscopic model that I would, uh, you know, you could derivate uh, the fraction of the motion stochastic velocity? Well, model? for that, I'm just going to refer you to the papers of Jason, first of all, Jason and Rosenbaum, right? So, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of this work. So, they started off, so if you take a Hawkes process, based model of market mm -hmm. microstructure. So basically you have 
buys arriving and sells arriving and the price goes up and the price goes down. If you take a naive limit of this thing, uh, obviously, Hawk's process is just a fancy Poisson process, so you take the limit, you get Brownian motion with constant volatility as the limit. And there was a paper written by maybe Bakri and Musi or something a few years ago that proves <coughs> this formally. And then, for whatever reason, I'm not sure what the reason was, uh, Mathieu had this idea that there in a, there's a very special way of taking the limit uh, that allows you to get something more interesting than um, than just Brownian motion with constant volatility. And uh, a, the first time he wrote about this, he had exponential kernel. And when you use exponential kernel in your Hox process, and the Hox process is nearly unstable, as the limit, you get the conventional Heston model. Then he started working on this rough stuff uh, because his student was working with me. And then he had this idea, ah, I know how to get rough volatility. We switch the exponential kernel with a power law kernel. And indeed, he wrote a paper, again with Thibault Gesson, to show exactly that. And then even more remarkably with another student of his who was also incredibly smart, this guy, Omar el Ush, whose name you will appear repeatedly in the next lecture. Uh, they, so the limit, with exponential kernel is the classical Heston model. The limit with a power law kernel is the uh, rough Heston model. And so why is Heston model so popular? Well, because there's a closed form characteristic function. So the question was going to be, uh, can we derive closed form characteristic function in the rough Heston model? And amazingly, they were able to do this with an incredibly complicated uh, computation uh, by considering limits of the underlying Hox process. Now, there are many other papers that came out that do this in a very much simpler way, but that's basically the history of it. Okay. I don't know if that answers your question. Quite a lot, thank you. Okay, so I guess this is a good time to break for, today, for, for this morning, for the first part of this morning to correct, I'm in the rough volatility mode. Um, so, uh, Sueli is around. Sueli, is everything okay? Oh, by the way, I'd like to thank Sueli. Sueli, come in, since we're talking. Uh, let's, let's, okay, let's thank Sueli for the wonderful work that she and her team did, okay? Good, good, so. And um, then, uh, just a quick announcement. This evening, for those of us who are staying in the hotel, uh, the dinner should be included, so so you can have dinner in the hotel. Uh, it's because we're not having uh, lunch on Thursday, so we got the deal of getting dinner tonight. Tomorrow we have the tomorrow we have the party or the dinner party or something for Bruno. And today, now, we should have something for Jim, whose birthday is actually today. So let's thank G Jim. Ah, thank and you. So we'll, have, we'll get outside for Jim's birthday. Happy oh, birthday, thank Jim. you. Uh, thank you, George. Oh, let me put this.